This koala and her baby as a species have been around for 25 million years. And over that time, her wants haven't really changed. Humans, we've been around for about 200,000 years in this current form of Homo sapiens sapien. And in the last 100 years, our needs have exploded. And of course, our population has also exploded. There's about 255 babies born every minute of every day. And what's happened is that as we get our needs met, the koala increasingly can't get her needs met because we share the same air, water, and soil. It's the same planetary boundaries. And what's happening is there's this split between the two worlds, right? We know this and so we feel bad and we, so we, we try to keep nature separate. It's beautiful, it's balanced, it should be conserved. Whereas industry is ugly and it's definitely unbalanced and yet it serves a necessary evil because we all want our stuff. So it should be regulated. And what's happening is that split is only getting worse. But there's another way to think about this and that's that nature is industrious. Over millions, hundreds of millions of years, billions of years, the best designs have emerged to allow all life on the planet to thrive. And we can start just by looking out our own window at the redwood trees, right? It can capture water and move it up 200, 300 feet without a pump. We can't do that. It can insulate against fire. It can also not fall down in earthquakes, even though they're incredibly tall. These are biological blueprints that we can all learn. And so if you're one of the important people in our world who makes what we all enjoy, this should be a huge relief because you can learn from the other 8.7 million other species out there. You're not on your own. Leonardo da Vinci was a biomimic. He was deeply curious about nature. He used to walk around with a notebook and make lists of all the different kinds of questions that he had. Buckminster Fuller, also a biomimic. And now there's a host of new innovators who are bio-inspired designers. And I just wanna tell you about a couple of them who are from our Ray of Hope teams. So the first one is Change Water Labs. Most of you know this, but more than half of the world doesn't have access to clean and safe toilets. There's no sewage infrastructure. There's no consistent electricity. If you're a family with a girl, you dig a hole next to your home because it's not safe for her to go off and use the bathroom on her own. And worse than that, every 20 seconds a child actually dies solely because of poor sanitation. So this is the eye throne, eye throne, and it works really differently than how we process our sewage. So we're constantly taking the waste out of our water supply. It's complicated filtration, but they're doing is actually taking the water out of waste because it turns out that 95% of our poop and our pee is water. So what they've created is a breathable bag that works a lot like how a plant will pull moisture out of the soil and release it as a water vapor through its stomata and its leaf. So this is a biodegradable bag that actually just releases water vapor. It doesn't drip, right? It's releasing water vapor. And what you end up with is a superior kind of porta potty, one that can go for two weeks without smelling because there is no liquid in it. At the same time, when, it, when you do have to collect it, it's a lot lighter because again, there's no liquid in it and the remnants can be used as fertilizer in the local forests, or it could be treated with UV filtration and actually used on crops. The next one is actually from Cypress Materials and they've tackled the question of color. So pigments and dyes and paints are an incredibly nasty business, but as humans, we're really attracted to color, and so we continue to, you know, we continue to crave it. Lead paint used to make beautiful color until we had to ban it because it caused brain damage. School bus yellow messes with our DNA. And the green paint of the recycling symbol that you'll see on 
all sorts of packaging it actually makes it hard to recycle that packaging and you certainly can't compost it because green is made with chlorine which causes cancer so when you look at this blue morpho butterfly you're not seeing pigment you're seeing light the wings have millions of stacked nanostructures that allow all the colors of the spectrum of visible light to pass through except for blue which actually gets reflected back to your eye and chemists now can make those nanostructures and cypress materials is making them out of bio-based materials which is really important when we're talking about the nanoscale so they've architected this paint to actually self-assemble so you just paint it on and it moves on its own into the right geometric form reflecting the right color back at you it's amazing because over time if you have to if it chips or you have to replace it it's never going to fade because it's light and they're also using the same process to create uv and infrared coatings for roofs and also for the exteriors of buildings to reflect heat so that will reduce the uh, amount of air conditioning load on the building so that's biomimicry in terms of form and process but we can also mimic an entire system we can mimic the forest as an ecosystem and so quick refresher course on how ecosystems work they rely on three players producers consumers and decomposers the blackberry bush is a producer or a plum tree is a producer and that fruit is consumed by the bird which then decomposes it into its own poop and that poop is further decomposed in the soil the whole process starts again right it's, it's material dispersal it's entropy it's the second law of thermodynamics and it's a whole system that's powered by the sun we have all seen it we all get it until we try to replicate it so when we go to make a normal water bottle what do we do we extract ancient carbon out of the ground and we pollute the skies at the same time we use 2,000 times the amount of energy to make a bottle as it would just to filter the same amount of water it's an incredibly inefficient system and we feel really bad about it so we try to do take back we take back about 30 percent of the bottles that are out there and we turn it into fleece fleece blankets fleece sweatshirts and it feels for a minute like decomposition because we've taken something back and we've turned it into something new but it's not the same because when it comes time to washing your fleece blanket you pop it in the washer dryer and in the dryer thousands of microfibers are spit into the air they land on the street and then they get washed away into the bay into our seafood dinner so you and i are eating a credit card size worth of plastic every year because of entropy so we need a system redesign because there is about 67 billion tons of stuff that we're not capturing and if it's hard for you to imagine 67 billion tons like it is for me imagine 183,000 empire state buildings and you're getting close so we can get better at take back and we should but it's again not the same as decomposition we really need to rethink our clothing for instance let's start with that as a biological nutrient as a biodegradable material because every second of every day we are dumping or burning the equivalent of a truckload of clothes if we're going to shift to a different system the first thing we have to do is get off of petroleum and you may nod and you're like yes that makes a lot of sense beth until you realize that we're talking about our stretch leggings right our polyester stretch leggings or our puffer jackets our nylon puffer jackets and then all of a sudden maybe it's not a great idea but don't worry because we can now make agricultural waste into high performance materials we can also take hemp and wool and actually process it in new ways and weave it in new ways that allow for it to be stretchy and still breathable and of course now antimicrobial because it has innately those same qualities so they'll be better than your leggings that you currently have now we just released a report for the fashion industry saying that we have all the technologies we need today to put everybody on the planet in biodegradable clothing and in fact rebecca burgess who's here in marin she runs fiber shed and she estimates that we can make 23 billion 
one pound garments. It's like a shirt is a one pound garment while feeding people, while sequestering carbon back into the soil, if we just return to regenerative agriculture, intercropping, kind of like on Biggest Little Farm, that would be a system redesign. So finally, let me close by talking about what gives me the most hope, and that's teenagers. So we run a youth design challenge for middle and high school kids. And this last year, we reached about 10,000 students. And I just want to tell you about a few of their designs because they're really just so impressive. The first one is sun tile, and they've created a hexagonal roof tile that fits together like a honeycomb. And the surface of the tile is actually triangular, just like the Saharan silver ant. And those triangles allow the heat and the sun to bounce off instead of getting absorbed, which would be an amazing innovation in places like Arizona or Sacramento. These kids were 12 years old. The second design is from a team at Redwood High School, and they rethought tidal kite energy. And tidal kite energy is when you capture the ocean currents and you store that as electrical energy. The problem with tidal kite energy is that it's often unstable because of the waves. So instead of looking to propellers or kites, they look to the Javan cucumber seed pod. And that's a pod that actually has dihedral wings that allow it to float on the wind for miles at a time. And by changing this design, they were able to achieve greater stability, which allowed them to capture more energy. The last one is solar collector. So they looked at the design of the Oriental Hornet, which is one of the few insects that actually flies around on really hot days because it's got an electrical assist. So its cuticles capture UV radiation. And what the design team did is they took that, that cuticle shape and they put it onto a plexiglass piece. And then they reflected that plexiglass back onto an ordinary solar panel. And they were able to get 25% greater energy output from the solar panel than it was on its own. All of these teams use our website. It's called asknature.org. And it's a place where anybody can go for inspiration or to get these kind of biological models. But the very first thing that I always say is just be curious. Be curious about how the world works. Be like Da Vinci, you know? Go out and get a notebook and start making a list of your questions. One of the questions you might have is, how does the ruby-throated hummingbird travel for 1,200 miles without stopping off of basically a couple ounces of nectar? How does it do that? How does its tongue work? And what happens is you start to notice more and more. You start to become a little bit more caring and concerned about the fate of the hummingbird or the fate of anything that you're looking at. And pretty soon you'll find yourself back in relationship with nature. So look to the 3,000 babies who were born while I've been talking. I say welcome. We are so glad that you are here. And I'm hoping that you're going to be part of a new kind of human one who cares about the whole planetary family and not just the ones who look like us. Thank you very much for listening and for your time. Now go outside. <laughs>